thanks for thanks to everybody for joining. Um, this is about the um, expected ratio of people who are in infosec versus people who are in infosec and actually like C2Dev. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time to come and join. Um, I see uh, Christo Gusen is also here. It's probably just because he's uh, volunteered to be here. Um, okay, so let me wait for you. Okay, I'm gonna just yeah, I'm gonna just go. So my name is Harold, um, also known as Harbot by absolutely nobody. Uh, I am a security engineer at BITM. Um, I do pen testing during the day, or uh, try to, and then uh, after hours I am more uh, malware dev, offensive security research and tooling, and then also uh, fiddle around with some automation. So what that basically just tells you is that I start a new project on uh, Friday, Friday afternoon, and then on Sunday night I get so pissed off that I just leave it and never touch it again. <laughs> Um, so you don't have to take photos of the uh, QR code because I think it is done. Uh, I thought, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know I was speaking last. So, yeah, okay. So the agenda is we're just going to cover what a C2 is, the difference between a server and a framework, um, the architecture, how to design your own if you're interested. Uh, some considerations, lessons learned, uh, which is basically just me being stupid, and then uh, some examples and cool courses. The C2 overview. So before we start what a C2 is, um, or how to make one, we kind of need to know what, what it is, right? So uh, C2 is basically just a attacker-controlled computer that uh, has access to a bunch of other a bunch of other victim computers, and it can remotely, uh, at, you know, remotely execute stuff. Uh, it does make the post exploitation life a lot easier if you are ever uh, doing like an Active Directory pen test or doing like a red team or something. Having tools available and ready to use makes your life a lot easier than just going back to all your GitHub bookmarks and downloading the tools and so on. Uh, various capabilities depending on the goal. So some C2s exist merely just for exfiltrating data, whereas others are for natural movement, whereas others are for like initial access. And um, they are, you know, it comes in a host of like different like shapes or sizes. Uh, paid open source, uh, so back when we were at uh, uh, ZeroXCon earlier the year, Leon made a joke and said, we don't need more C2s. We, need, we don't need more paid C2s, but we can always use more open source C2s. So, um, and then it is the threat, threat actors, most beloved tool. So almost most to almost all of the modern day attacks um, have a C2 in some shape, way, or form. If you look at like all the, um, if you look at all the breaches and you read uh, how many times Cobalt Strike was deployed in an operation that, uh, you know, that, that breached the company and then ended up in ransomware or data, data exfiltration. So why make your own? Um, first of all, minimal IOCs. So IOC standing for indicator of compromise. And if you create something custom or if you create something that hasn't been seen yet or isn't well known, you tend to fly under the radar a little bit easier. Uh, custom solution. So for my one, uh, we need something to actually automate some, some uh, automate some uh, commands for for um, like a purple team assessment and Caldera is good but we also just need something that um, we also just needed something that you know like that fits our solution so yeah um, it helps you understand attacks a lot better so if you can create it I'm one of the people that if I create something I know how it works and a lot of the people especially in this in, uh, especially in this community is 
let me make it, or let me break it, then let me make it, then I know how it works. So that's kind of like another reason why you want to make your own field contribution. Um, there are, in the C2 matrix, um, I don't have the link on me, but there's something like 150, if not more, like open source, or ranging between open source and paid, but most of them are open source. So if you create something or if you help somebody with a popular open source C2, you know, you put yourself and you put your name on it. Um, it just helps improve the field overall and it because uh, better attacker tools eventually lead to better defensive tools. Um, improving your skills, I think that's a that's a very like obvious one because you'll probably start not knowing anything unless you're a genius. Um, otherwise, yeah, you'll start like me not knowing, you know, A to Z on the keyboard and then actually uh, you know, having something that's pretty decent. And then finally, career development. Uh, a lot of people, especially in interviews, if you, if you can create something and you can talk about it and you can show why it's important or you can show how much you learned through the whole process, um, it's a lot better than explaining what a SQL injection is or something like that. It just shows your expertise within a certain field. And then also you learn a lot. So you learn how to set up a web server, how to create your own web server, because a C2 server is kind of like a web server that you can communicate through. Um, so if you have that like first-hand practical knowledge, like practical knowledge is the best knowledge. Um, so we'll go into a server versus a framework. So it kind of is the same, like same, same, but not same. Um, so server, from what is mostly known is it is a uh, it's more designed for specific techniques uh, it's more it's smaller uh, it normal like single operator focused and uh, like shorter term usage and uh, low IOCs depending on the uh, um, depending on the <clears throat> on the operation so what I mean by uh, uh, specific techniques in that uh, if you look at like some of these um, if you look at some of these uh, servers here, uh, you know, one is literally just made to communicate over DNS. The other one is a C2 over uh, like Google, like Google Calendar. The one is a C2 over like Discord. Like it's all just very, for very specific, made for blending in type of operations. Um, then you have your framework. So your framework is the more batteries included type of uh, type of uh, application. Uh, think of Cobalt Strike. Uh, think of Havoc, um, PowerShell Empire. I'm pretty sure a lot of you have used and um, okay. Well, I don't put it in here, but Meterpreter as well, or Metasploit as well. It has a lot of functionality that's built in that you can use and that you can play around with whenever you gain that initial shell. Like you can load extra modules, you can do extra exploits. You know, it has all that where as a basic server it does not have that. Um, and then the rest of the points, you know, uh, multiple protocols and longer term operations and stability. That's an important one. So with your, uh, like I'm gonna use uh, Godot, um, which one of the guys from SensePost made. And that is literally designed to like communicate only over DNS and um, mainly for like uh, exfiltration purposes. Um, so this is the basic architecture. Uh, you have your little hacker guys on the, uh, it's too late in the day to say if it's your right or my right, uh, but it's my left. So yeah, you guys can work that out. Um, you have your you have your gentleman sitting there, and they communicate with the server in the middle. The server does some kind of read write operation from your uh, to like a persistent method, like a database. Uh, it can be a database; it doesn't have to be a database. I'll show you how I did mine, and then you can communicate with multiple infected uh, computers. Uh, the communication process it's basically you know, just log into your console, log into the server. 
you send instruction, instructions to the server. Um, the server holds onto it. The beacon or the implant calls back to the server and, say, and says, do you have anything for me? The server gives it an instruction. It executes the instruction and it sends the results back to the server. And that is, uh, and the server then sends the results back to the um, back to the operator. And that, in a nutshell, is C2 communication. So I'll go over what important design factors and that you need to like kind of like keep in mind when making it. Um, the first one, which I also didn't list here, mainly because I was lazy, is you need to. Uh, get a cool name and a cool logo for it. That is, yeah. Um, so, like, when you look at like a project chart, the first ninety percent of the project is coming up with the naming of everything, and uh, yeah. And then you kind of need to, then you kind of need to decide if you're going to make it a command line, a GUI, and a or a web. Um, obviously, there's like a bunch of different, like, um, there's a bunch of different pros and cons of both. CLI, you know, is it going to work in the Windows terminal? Is it going to work in the Linux terminal? Terminal? Is it going to work in both? Uh, GUI, you need to like kind of like think, you know, what kind of like framework am I going to use? Uh, is it going to be Qt? Is it going to be um, is it going to be uh, Electron for whatever reason you want to do that? Um, or do you want to make it in the web? Uh, what kind of technologies are you going to use? Are you going to run it? Um, you know, you kind of like need to run it on the Chromium, on the Chromium browser, not the Chrome browser, or any browser that doesn't do like any safety checks in that because you are going to upload and download malware, and 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 and, and the last thing you want to do is like run it in Chrome and you go and download the results and it's like a dump file or whatever, and you know Google Chrome just stops you. So. Chromium, uh, and then the front-end framework for it. Is it going to be like React? Is it going to be, you know, you, you get the gist of it. Uh, UX UI, just as important as the malware techniques. So obviously, you don't want to click 10,000 times just to create an implant. You kind of like need to think how you're going to do it, what is the best way to do it, what is the fastest way to do it. Obviously the actions that take that are most important you put top on your list and then you need to create it in a way that like if you need to do reporting or whatever like stuff it in there somewhere but don't let it like distract the operator from the from the main from the goal um, I like to store uh, this isn't always but I like to store the payload and the modules on the operator side of it it's my machine uh, let me keep my stuff if you send it on the server, or if you store all your payloads and your modules on the server, the more you use it over time, uh, the fuller the you know more disk space it uses. And if you're running it on a small device, or you're running it on something that needs to be shut uh, shut down quickly, or opened, or you know like be decommissioned or commissioned quickly because your operation got burned or whatever, um, yeah, if you store it there, then all your payloads and your modules get burned, or you know goes along with it. So uh, you use this to interact with the beacons through the server. So little hacker man over there, he is logging into his console, communicating with the server, and then you can also use it to manage multiple servers. So through like just authentication, you can log out. You can use your console. You can log out and just log back into another server with a diff different IP address and different credentials. Um, here is the server, so it needs to have multiplayer mode. Multiplayer mode basically just means, um, you know, multiple operators can log into it at the same time. So not like free Metasploit, but more like a Cobalt Strike or uh, Havoc or something like that. Um, then uh, support multiple protocols. So you have your beaconing protocols, which is normal, normally HTTP, HTTPS, and DNS. And then you have your peer-to-peer, -peer, which you use for internal, like if you need to pivot from one machine to another machine, which is normally like SMB, or it could also be eight, or TCP or UDP or anything. Um, as long as it works, it, you know, normally it can support mo multiple protocols, not always, depending on what your goals and objectives are. Uh, authenticated uh, communication, this is super important. You don't want a blue teamer to 
uh, you know, hack you back. <laughs> That's going to be very bad for the operation. Um, I think their CISO will be impressed, but yours not as much. Um, so it needs to be stable. Error handling, you don't want one simple error of like crashing your whole server. So you need to put the exceptions in. You need to kind of like think about the edge cases. How am I going to do this? What can go wrong? And then what can go wrong that I haven't thought about, but I still need to handle it. Um, I designed mine in a API type of form. Um, there's been a lot of like, I don't know who's been in the API classes and that, um, or uh, familiar with like the whole API design of everything. But because it's in the API, your server can be coded in whatever language, your operator console can be coded in whatever language, and your um, implant can be coded in whatever language. As long as it communicates through the API endpoints, you are good to go. So that makes it awesome uh, if you, if I write something in Golang, which I do uh, because I love Golang, um, but somebody else writes something in Rust or C or C Sharp or whatever, you can write it in whatever as long as it hits the endpoints. Um, then scriptable. Uh, so depending on, depending on, again, your design, um, with mine is I have a JSON file that it say or writes everything to a JSON file because I don't like SQL, um, and you can basically, you know, you can like just drop that JSON file in, or you can script it to when the server starts up, it fetches that JSON file and it already sets up your listeners and your implants and all that. Um, and then the actual fun part, the making of the malware, which I think some might find it fun, others might find it a bit daunting. Um, this needs to be kind of like of a modular design. Um, so how I designed mine was basically you can take and remove different parts of the program, and as long as like the as long as the basis they uh, it will work. So uh, modular design, you can like move it around, you can load extra modules onto it, you can do whatever you need, or it's just flexible. Uh, specific stages, and it is not load shitting. Um, it is uh, stage zero, is it more of like a loader? Does it do like host checks before calling on um, like a more, is it a light piece of malware that just does a bunch of like light checks? Is it running in a VM? Is the host name correct? Is the uh, domain name correct? Am I targeting the right company? Did the right guy, did he download it from his own computer? Did he download it on a company computer? You know, you need to do these kind of things to be responsible so that you don't run your malware on the wrong device. Um, so is that, that's more of like a stage zero, and if all those checks passed, then you go and fetch your actual malware. Um, format as executable output. So you kind of like need to make it as a compiled binary. Um, if you do something like just like a .py file or .js file or whatever, um, you know, you don't know what version of Python the client is running or if they're running Python at all. So you can't just run a .py file and expect it to like always work. I scratched this out because I actually, um, at the Zero XCon, I said, if you don't like, if all the Python lovers, if you don't like it, meet me outside. One of them did meet me, <laughs> one of them did meet me outside to my surprise, and they just said, oh, you can use this and this and this and this to compile it. So, you know, to satisfy them, they're not even here, but to satisfy them, I did a strike through. Um, yeah, petty, I know. Uh, the size of the beacon, so do you want it to be small? Uh, run in a certain type of environment, or do you, because sometimes you kind of like want to make your malware just basically expand. Uh, some antiviruses, I don't know if they still do it, but they would o only read the first like 25 megabits or 25 megabytes of a file, and then after that they would just say, okay, the file's too big, you know, uh, go through. Um, yeah, so yeah, you, you get what you pay for, I guess. Um, and then, you know, you kind of like need to put that into consideration. Also, the language that you coded in, uh, something that's made in Golang isn't going to be very small. Something that's made in C or C++, it's going to be a bit, it's going to be a bit smaller. And then the uh, multi-platform. 
so this is another design that you need to, or another choice that you need to make. Uh, are you targeting Windows specifically? Are you targeting, targeting Macs? Are you targeting Linux? Are you targeting everything? How are you going to do it? Are you going to make three different uh, implants in three different languages? Are you going to use something like Rust or Go that you can just cross compile and go mad? Um, that is all, you know, that's another design uh, decision that you need to make. And then the uh, bolt in sleep function. So would you have like a semi like cheap loader inside of your um, inside of your beacon and you know how's it going to handle the sleep uh, so are you going to like encrypt all your bad bits up until the loader or the beacon wakes up calls back to the server unencrypts those bits in memory runs the bad stuff after that send a result back encrypt it again and goes back to sleep so that is a yeah um, so just yeah, you can see there with the, the whole sleep function, it sleeps, um, it goes and fetches the instruction from the server, it unloads and unencrypts, it processes the, uh, the bad stuff, it sends the results and it uh, goes back to sleep again. And yeah, that's the whole beaconing um, overview. Okay, um, then you kind of need to, or you kind of, if you don't want to do all that and you just want to make the cool stuff like the malware, you can use and misuse existing like frameworks um, to actually just, you know, to actually just make your malware. Like you don't have to create a whole custom C2 server. There are a lot of current C2 frameworks out there that allows you to expand and, uh, you know, basically piggy piggyback off of their like, yeah, piggyback off of their like, um, their hard work and you only get to focus on the fun part. Um, stuff like execute assembly and uh, which is basically just running running .NET code in memory, um, which is pretty cool because you can you can literally just any like C sharp file or whatever you can like pass it through and it will run it in memory. You don't have to like you don't have to create your own beacon for that. You can just create like a little module that does that. And then the same with the cough loaders, where instead of it being a .NET, it's more of just like an object file that gets like um, that gets run into memory, um, which is probably the best way of doing things like right now. Um, and then obviously you want to test everything for stability, you want to test it for IOCs, and then you want to test it for like functionality and that and make sure that like all your edge cases are handled. So here are three good projects. Um, the one Mythic actually just got a like a recent release. Um, it, yeah, it's like, yeah, the, the design of that thing is out of the, this world. Uh, Hard Hat is kind of like the new like kid on the block. They have a whole like blog post about like how you can make your own implant or how you can like extend it if you want to, so you don't have to like focus on coding the server and the client and all that. And then uh, one of the people I on a group with uh, made this like uh, Revenant, which is that demon skull type of thing, um, the other demon skull type of thing. Um, on the thing and yeah, you can basically just uh, it allows you to run like imagine in like an old type of C which is well, old type, old C is old type but yeah, it can run on like fucking anything okay, so this is how I designed mine, you have the operator in the server um, your operator has all the uh, meat to it, um, your modules, your invasions, uh, evasions, beacon, like all your configs in your console and stuff like that. And your server just, it's literally just there to handle the listener and handle the communication. That's, that's it. And this is basically what it looks like. Uh, I have the CLI sort of ready, which I'll show you some screenshots. And then the beacon is in Go. I've played around with Rust to have it working in some extent, and C Sharp I haven't touched, but yeah, the slide just looked empty, so I threw it in there. And then also with the GUI, um, I also haven't touched that because yeah, I decided to just make it in CLI because you know it can also look like CLI can also look pretty, but I'll show you now. Um, and this is the beacon building. Um, process so you have your modules folder 
you, the operator, then chooses which modules he wants to put into his implant, and then uh, also what the listener info is. Uh, it gets sent to two different uh, JSON files, and then it gets run, then the source builder project, then gets, uh, then basically goes and fetches those files. It builds it out as a piece of source code, and then it compiles it into, uh, you'll see the demo.star, that is the actual source code, and then the last one is the compilation of it. So is it, is it overcomplicated? Maybe. Uh, do I care? No. <laughs> So this is just basically the module selection where you can choose it. Um, I shamelessly ripped the um, examples out of Bubble T's uh, GitHub uh, repository, which is a awesome framework for um, making like uh, terminal user interfaces. Um, I didn't want it to just look basic because I mean, just because we hack stuff and attack stuff doesn't mean we're animals. We also deserve <laughs> we also deserve pretty things. <laughs> Um, so yeah, and this also this also um, kind of eliminates human error. I mean, there's no way for you to type something in here. Well, I say that now, but I haven't really tried it. But yeah, there's no way for you to type something in, so you can't type in the wrong module name or anything like that. You just press up and down, and you press uh, the space button, and you select what you want. Uh, this is basically the module example. Um, so every module gets its own, or every yeah, every module gets its own file, and it's stored in the modules folder. This is a super basic, uh, super basic example. So what it will do is it will read the uh, the MIDAs like TTP. It will read the description, and then it has the um, the public function, which it will then pull into the uh, final, like final source code. Um, this is the module config folder. So when you load the thing, or when you load the server up, or you load, yeah, when you load the server up, and you, when you load your operator console up, what it will do is there's a script that runs that goes and fetches all of the modules, and it displays it like this. I will show you now why. So when you choose the help and this is where it goes in. And you can basically, um, again, bubble tease like um, a table, which you can search from. There in the lower my right uh, corner, and you can just vim style forward slash go and search for what modules you want, instead of like scrolling through a list. So I made it this way, uh, just in case there is like 100 modules and you don't always know what you want, but if you know you want scan, then you can, uh, you can search for scan. Uh, this is the listener config. Um, yeah, there's not much to it. It's basically just the same as with the, like, um, the, same as, like, with the other things. You can fold this in uh, pre-starting up your server. And then when you load it in, you can just drop that into your like configuration file and uh, just click uh, run, run listeners, and then it will start everything up for you. Um, the profile at the bottom is just to make it more uh, malleable, and just so it, like if you need to like emulate a specific adversary or something like that, um, you can just like fill it in there without it being too much of a pain. Uh, again, this is the uh, uh, listener creation. So again, uh, ripped out of Bubble T's like GitHub repo. Uh, probably saved me like years because I have no idea how to start this. Um, so it instead of having like a instead of having like a label, uh, it basically just has like dark text. And then as soon as you like hover over it or you start typing, then it will start filling in. Um, and then after that, you click submit, and then it will. Uh, this will be filled in. And this is the implant config. So again, um, it's going to be something similar to this, and then just mixed up with the like checkboxes. And I'm going to show you how I did mine. But yeah, this is a warning. It is honest work, but yeah, it ain't much. Um, so this is the, oops, go back, okay. So this is the final demo.star uh, block, which is basically the source code. 
um, and I made it, it's, <laughs> it's not a bug, it's a feature, right guys? So I made it so that you can like um, surgically modify everything before compiling um, because the compiler will go and fetch it from a predetermined um, uh, uh, file location. And basically the boulder function on my right uh, it's just like a like a simplified version of what it does. It basically when you run it, you it goes and fetches all the import, which in Golang it's just format dot print, and then it's like a thousand lines of like a thousand strings of a thousand imports. And when you compile it, it will only take the imports it needs. Um, again, fun and then with the uh, the host name, it will go and fetch it from your fetch it from the implant config file and uh, uh, place it in here. Well, it will read from the implant uh, config file, then it will go and fetch that specific section in the modules folder and throw it in here. Uh, the server, um, you know, from the listener config file, the requests. Uh, this is like if it's HTTP, HTTPS, SMB, DNS, um, or not SMB, uh, DNS, HTTP, HTTPS. Uh, it will go and um, yeah, it will go and like said if it's if it's HTTP, put this in. If it's HTTPS, put that in. And then the modules, which will basically just go and fetch it from um, from the top there and throw it in here. Why I didn't make the f the the handle funks uh, function and handles modules function one function, I can't tell you. Not because I don't want to tell you, just because I thought of this design and I was probably like three beers deep. And yeah, I was just like, yeah, this works. I'm gonna do it this way. Um, one cool thing about it is you can actually just go and change the case. So um, if there is any alerts or if there is any monitoring on certain endpoints like get hostname or kill or uh, uh, reg keep assist, you can change that into whatever you want. So if there is any detections on specific endpoints um, or specific functions being called, then you can, um, yeah, then that will help you with uh, evading the detection because we do all know how brittle uh, antivi antivirus is. Okay, um, OPSEC basics, which is basically me being stupid. So uh, um, turn off sample submission. So when you make something and you test it, especially on Windows, uh, Windows Defender will always go and grab that sample, submit it to a cloud or submit it to the cloud and then uh, come back and say if it's malicious, if it's not, and if it's not malicious or it's suspicious or whatever, it will go and fetch it and store it in the cloud and go and analyze it further. Um, that leads into keeping it offline. So if you can make your own local area network that doesn't reach out to the internet, that way Defender can't keep it out, but you can still test for antivirus detection or evasion, um, that would be great. So one thing I do is I have a local GitLab server at home which I run all the uh, CI/CD stuff on the local server without reaching out to the cloud. And that I'd like to think that it helps with um, detection or at least evading detection or leaking of uh, like samples. So far it's worked, but uh, yeah, I think it works because I like to think it works. Um, and then know your enemy. So if you're gonna be testing against antivirus or defenses like Defenses are your enemy. You're gonna want to evade. Like, what's the point of making malware? Um, what's the point of making malware if you like, you know, if it gets if it gets detected by everything and anything under the sun? Um, but where to share? So, if you share your malware to your friends or to your colleagues over Teams, over like Google or whatever, and you're like, hey, check this. I made this. Like, look how good I am. Um, it's gonna get burnt because they're gonna run it, they're not gonna put all these considerations, um, they're not gonna take all these steps and considerations that you did, so yeah. So we actually, at the previous company, uh, we had like a we had like a malware group and I had this like ransomware that was made in them and it was beautiful and it worked and Defender didn't pick up anything. Um, 
all the files were encrypted and the vendor just said, you know, your device is safe. Um, I shared it on the group and yeah, true as Bob, the next day, like, yeah, yeah, like a whole weekend gone. Uh, stay away from your host. So this is kind of obvious. Um, again, with that like malware, I made it in a VM um, and I'm glad I did because I tested it out and I forgot to, like I got lazy with the file pass and instead of saying like C slash this, this, this to the specific like, um, like specific folder that I wanted to test, I just said C slash and it locked up my entire VM and I am happy that I made it in a VM because, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I said, this OPSEC basics are basically like, don't be a, like, don't be a dumbass. Um, and then be a little tr paranoid when shooting, or trouble, not shooting, troubleshooting. So if uh, you make something or you're gonna hit a roadblock eventually, like, like don't throw it in open AI. Um, yeah, like, why would you do that? Like, yeah, don't just say, hey, listen, you know, why, why, is, why is ransomware not working? Or, you know, what's wrong with this code or whatever? Um, this is for the new kids, for the uh, older lot. Um, I'm very thankful that there are not a lot of you in this room because we will outnumber you. Um, is don't throw it into Stack Overflow and say, hey, why is this not working? Because, uh, yeah, you're basically, you're basically burning your malware if you, just throw, if you just throw it into like a public forum or you submit it to any like online thing or whatever. You don't know what data they collect. You don't know what they're taking away from your... From your um, and then also, I think this goes without saying, it's like don't publish it on GitHub unless you are ready for it to be burned. Um, yeah, even when it's on private, um, I don't trust Microsoft enough to know, or you know, to not burn my stuff, to, uh, to feed that monster that they call uh, ChatGPT. Okay, and yeah, this is basically just visualized, keep it offline, because um, this is what happened to me. My malware got burned because I sent it to the cloud, and yeah a visual representation of me. And then uh, these are more for testing. Like, what do you, like, you need to like kind of think, you know, if you're gonna use this in the field, do you wanna use it at, as a pen test, as a red team, as a purple team? But then you also need to kind of test on uh, different, like um, the domain controllers, the clients. Can it work on Windows 2008? Can it work on 2003? like 2012, uh, 2012, 2016, how does it work? How does it function? Same with, the, same with the endpoints, you know, Windows 10, Windows 11, Windows 7, Windows 8. Is it 32-bit? Is it 64-bit? Like, these are all like the kind of like things you need to like, like, like think of when you, when, you, when you make something like this. So with Golang, um, I think Golang before 1.12, could still work on uh, could still work on Windows 2003. Uh, after that, they just like stopped official support. Um, but yeah, so if anything breaks, then yeah. And then it also goes for stability. Like you need to like again, kind of like think of like the edge cases in that. Like what happens if the internet cut out, or if you're busy downloading a file, you're busy exfiltrating data, and the internet cuts out. Do you, did you? Do you have a function that actually saves it as a .tem file and then reads it and then when the internet cuts out, like the, the thing pauses and then when it comes back on, then it continues downloading or does it just fail and when, the, when you eventually get a call back again, can you like uh, start restart the download? Um, that's also with the different like scenarios in that. And then uh, different capabilities like, yeah, don't, don't try, well, you can if you want. I'm not gonna stop you, but um, don't try and just make this like super advanced thing from the start. Like, kind of like think like, okay, let's just get a basic shell. Now you kind of need to think what happens, can I upload and download stuff? That's the next step. The next step is doing like, like checks, like, you know, is it a VM? If it's a VM, can I handle this? Like, you kind of like 
take that like gradual like as you increase with your skills and confidence uh, so does your so does your malware and so does like the functionality and the capabilities uh, final hurdles the things that absolutely nobody wants to talk about and that is fine uh, I didn't want to talk about it either but um, yeah I have a set time so I need to fill that time um, so documentation it's easier to just start writing it when you get started like your ideas in that and then later as soon as you complete something or something works write how it works why it works and that and then when you actually do book out like a documentation day aka for me it's like a saturday night um then you know you read through all these notes and you're like oh okay i see um i just want to stress that i am by no means a developer so i don't know what you guys go through um yeah, this is just my this is just my weekend project or um, when I'm done with work. My boss is sitting here, so I can't say that I'm doing it during the day. Um, but uh, yeah, wink, wink. Uh, installation. So are you going to distribute it like you want people to use it when you actually do get ready to uh, submit it and um, or like get people to share it? Are you going to send it as like a binary? Are you going to send it as like a Docker file? Uh, because we all love Docker. Um, are you going to have like the full setup steps, the full support? What happens if this goes wrong? Did you try and install it on different devices? How, how well does it work on Ubuntu versus Kali? Because there is a difference. Uh, does it work on Windows? You know, like does it work on Mac? Like all these type of things. And then uh, with tests. So I'm not going to get too in too much of it because I can talk your ear off about tests. But uh, yeah, you kind of like need to have this like automated checks in place to make sure that everything runs as needed. Um, just the lessons before we finish up. Uh, start small, build big. Comes back to what I was saying, like start with something that's just basically a reverse shell and you log into like the server. It's not even like a console or anything. You basically just log into the server and you can communicate with a beacon on another computer. Like just start there. Don't try and think like, we're gonna like do this now or at least that's how i started i know like developers that can probably do this in like a like a friday night but for me it took like six months um you know back up your work so you know with the gitlab um don't use to github um you know don't be afraid to start over so the current one that i made with all like the design considerations and that was probably my like my 10th like uh, like my 10th iteration of it. Uh, each time I would make it, I'd get frustrated. I'd just say, you know, rm-r and just rip that uh, directory out of my computer. Like it's, yeah. Um, get it working. So that's probably the most, um, that's probably the most important thing is like get it working first before trying to optimize it. If you're going to sit and you're going to like what is the best way to do this? What is the best way to do this? What is the best way to do this? And you kind of like start overthinking and you kind of like start, you get panicked because now it's this like whole complicated thing and you started with the simple idea and it's now like built into this like thought monster. Um, and now you're just like, okay, now I'm gonna get discouraged and I'm gonna get back to that like when I can. Um, choose a language that you're comfortable in you can make it in literally anything. There's like stuff written in, I know people joke about PHP, but there's stuff written in PHP, there's stuff written in only in JavaScript and Node, a lot of stuff written in Golang, uh, Python. Um, there's even one guy that was brave enough to like write it in like pure C, like client, server, implant, like everything just C like a, like a madman. But it was pretty impressive. Uh, take breaks, um, and then uh, GitHub is full of references. So. I know I said like sharing on GitHub is bad, but if you read on GitHub, maybe it's not that bad. Um, or at least while you're developing something, like, you know, then you don't want to get it like prematurely like burned. But GitHub is full of references. If you're comfortable with a language, um, GitHub becomes like the world's biggest library. You can read code left, right, and center. You can understand it, and it's just like, yeah. Um, these are some cool projects that I uh, borrowed code from, um, aka just like 
thanks, I'll take that, you know. <laughs> uh, but to be fair, they also took it from somebody else. So, you know, is it stealing if you're like stealing from somebody who stole? Is that moral dilemma? Uh, it's just code. So, yeah, it's probably not that bad. So a lot of them you'll see, um, so NumPlant and Empire are the only two that is not written in Go. Um, that probably gives you an idea that I love Go. Um, so yeah, these are some pretty cool ones. I will be sharing it on the uh, Hack South group, uh, the slides and everything. So if you guys wanna like click links or whatever, I promise it's, <laughs> I'm not gonna rickroll you. I didn't have time to do it. Um, but yeah, like if you guys do want to like click links or whatever, I will be sharing this on the uh, Discord group. Uh, but here's some cool courses to get you started. Uh, it's probably important to that I say it that one course isn't going to make you like bold the C2 of your dreams. Um, but this, these are some pretty good like um, some pretty good like examples on how to get your feet wet. Two of them are in um, kind of like C sharp in Python. <laughs> I don't know why I put it on here. These are the only that I could find on the market, but I don't do it in, in any of them. Um, but yeah, so, but the techniques that they teach you, especially the one from Rasta Mouse is pretty good. Um, and then the uh, middle one, uh, Joe Hell, it is, uh, I think it's like $10 or $5 and it's made entirely of Python. So if you wanna like make something like that, that's, yeah. These are some cool YouTube videos. Again, I'll share it. And then the Malware, uh, Maldave Academy, well, which I get my inspiration from. Like, I see what they make. I see the C source code, and then I just rewrite it and go, because uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm cool like that. And yeah, thank you for your time. I know it's been a long day, and I hope none of you have questions. But if you do, I'd be uh, happy to happy to answer. Yeah. So there's a lot of C2 projects out there that you can contribute to. Um, so Havoc is a great example. Um, that guy, when he wrote it, he was probably like 17, 18 years old, which it's incredible if you look at like the quality and like the craftsmanship, craftsmanship of the software. Um, he regularly releases like bug fixes in that, um, and that is just from people, people complaining that there is a bug and then somebody just picking it up um, or building something for it. So with Havoc, you can also, um, let me just, um, so with Revenant, the uh, uh, demon thing there in the white, that is literally just a extension that was built only for the Havoc framework. So if you wanted to like only make like an implant, or if you use this every day, even with like Metasploit, if you use this every day, and there's a new exploit out there, and you know how to write the, like an exploit module for that code. Uh, or for that specific thing, and it can also integrate into Metasploit. I mean, yeah, that's that's gold. Like in terms of like field contribution, because they will just say, "Look at this guy. He's awesome. He wrote a he wrote a exploit that now fits into Metasploit." Okay. Uh, if that's yeah. Um, thanks for the for the talk. Um, I was just curious. There's there's a part where it seems like the the person. Yeah. Uh, you thought about something around generating the AI, for example, where you can get some input from some returns, or otherwise, you know, you at least know the land a bit, and you get some AI to do some kind of finer, interesting things that, that are guided by, by what you want. Um, let me see a, a good Rob there at the back is uh, pushing me on. So uh, let me talk with you while we while we go out there. Yeah, um, there is actually a super cool project that's uh, that's with that. Yeah. Can discuss a little bit during six o'clock in the afternoon. We need to wrap this up. There's closing and price giving stuff down. Cool. So. 
Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. It's good that there's so many good questions. Thanks, Rob. I like your, I like your beard.